Welcome to week eight of our wonderful Anthropology 32 class. Welcome back. I'm happy to see you. So this lecture will be relatively short, but we'll go over some information about the Navajo Indians uh, who are living in northern Arizona, southern Utah, southern Colorado, and eastern uh, New Mexico. Here is our study guide for week number eight. And you can see that it uh, has our normal kind of uh, information at the top. And then as you scroll down, it's got uh, yellow highlighted blue font for various uh, bits of information that you particularly want to pay attention to while I'm talking to you today and while you read your textbook, as well as these other categories, which are also important, but um, not quite as important, maybe. We'll go to our PowerPoint now. So this is um, about the Navajos. The Navajos name for themselves is the people, where in Navajo it's Dene. Uh, the Dene people have been uh, living uh, in the area where they're located now for at least a thousand years. Um, in one video you'll see a little later, the uh, elders mentions 2000 years. So they've been there quite some time. You'll notice that um, there are four sacred mountains, uh, which are sort of the traditional boundary of where the Navajos lived. And I think what happened is after they were, uh, you know, captured and uh, they went on the long walk from where their homeland was, uh, you know, by Kit, Car Kit Carson and um, other soldiers took them to New Mexico, and then eventually they got to come back home. And the reservation, I think, ended up being a little bit more this direction than where they probably were originally. So here's these four sacred mountains that is the boundary for the Navajo people. And it's not that they wouldn't go outside of that area. This is just their traditional homeland. Right in the middle here are the Hopi people. So the Hopis and the Navajos each have their own reservation. And there were disputes about certain areas um, that both thought belonged to them. And eventually that went through the courts. It took a very long time. And finally, there was a settlement where uh, they would eventually, after some long period of time, people were supposed to move out who were Navajo that were what became Hopi land or Hopis that what in what became Navajo, Navajo territory. And it wasn't a violent strife, but it was a legal battle that went on for quite some time. The Hopis uh, live on three mesas, and we'll be um, seeing uh, some information about the oldest um, continually uh, occupied town in America, which is um, over a thousand years at Old Aribe, which is on Second Mesa right in here. A long time ago, uh, <laughs> when I was in middle school, my family and I lived on the Navajo Reservation. So we spent one year in Tuba City and then one year up here at a place called Shiprock. Um, so I'm happy to be able to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about the, the Navajo people. How large is the reservation? Uh, 27,000 square miles and then of the people who, there are about 300,000 enrolled members who are Navajos. Actually, there may be a lot more people who consider themselves uh, to be Navajos, because as you probably know, um, sometimes you can be part, um, your blood is part of a tribe, but maybe not enough, or you can't prove it to become an enrolled member of the tribe. And that's true for all of the tribes in the United States. The Cherokees um, are a people who, uh, have probably, the, they're the largest group. And one of the reasons why is because they had uh, traditionally had a pretty open uh, point of view as far as um, how much uh, blood did you have to have? I kind of hate to use that term, uh, Cherokee blood, did you have to have to be a Cherokee? Um, but Navajos are the second largest tribe. And on the reservation, there's about 173,000 people living who are Navajo, maybe five or 6,000 people who are all the other races, normally teachers and people who work uh, in small towns on the reservation, helping with healthcare. 
uh, and they only can be living on the reservation if they're not a Navajo because they're working for an agency that has arranged with the Navajo to provide housing for their workers, which is what happened with my family and myself because my parents were teachers and uh, we got, lived in teacher housing. But it was only something you rented and you could not buy land on the reservation. That comes to about six people per mile. And Sonoma County has about 83 people per mile, <laughs> square mile. So a lot more population. Here's a picture of Sonoma County. Here's a picture on the Navajo Reservation. So last week we learned that in the entire Southwest, uh, including where the Navajos live, it's not very productive land. And uh, most people can't even grow this much corn. In the movie you'll see this week, the family's really lucky because they have some land at the bottom of the canyon where there is some water, and then they have some grazing land in another location. So they actually move back and forth between, uh, I believe, three different locations, uh, including some farming land where they can grow corn. But most Navajos don't have this kind of space. They just have rocks and very light vegetation because there's so little water. And you can grow sheep on the reservation. Most of the Navajo families that live out away from town do have some sheep and they have to herd those sheep, take care of them. The sheep, there are more sheep um, on the reservation than can really, there's not really enough grass for them all. And that's a bit of a problem overgrazing. It leads to more sections of the land um, becoming desert. But on the other hand, there's really not a good alternative for the people. So it's not like there's factories or assembly plants or call centers where people can work. So people need to be able to have food. And one of the best sources of food are sheep. <laughs> this, um, I thought you might be interested. There's a, a TV show called Dark Winds, which is based on a Tony Hillerman book. Uh, Tony Hillerman is an Anglo or white person who lived in uh, Albuquerque. And he became a really good friends of the Navajo tribe. And in fact, the Navajo Tribal Council has given him awards for being such a good friend and accurately representing the culture. They took his book and changed quite a bit of things in this TV show, but still overall, it's probably the best one that's out there and it's recent uh, that shows what life is like on the reservation. And this was um, set in the early 1970s even though it was made in the 2020s, since 2022 it came out. So Navajo clans are groups of families that are related. And when you introduce yourself, one Navajo to another, they shake hands. And then you'll see this if you watch that video, which I do recommend, uh, Dark Winds. Uh, Eventually, one of the uh, policemen who's been sort of uh, enculturated a little bit in uh, mainstream society eventually introduces himself in the correct way. Um, I tell the, the person the name, which clan, born of clan, because it's another part of your family, another side of your family, and then the other part of your clan clan relationships, and then finally this last one. So that way the person you meet knows if they're related to you, which is great, we can be cousins sort of like, or not at all related, in which case, well, maybe we can go on a date or something like that. But it's really important that people know um, how, where you come from, not just physically, but also as far as your family goes. Oh, one other thing to mention. Um, <laughs> when we first moved to the reservation, some people who had been there a while said, shake hands with us. They were Anglo people, so we shook hands. And they said, that's great. Now, everybody you shake hands with will think that you're some sort of a missionary, uh, even if you're not. Maybe you are, but they'll think you are. And we're like, what? What are you talking about? Because you're giving a really hard handshake. And the way that traditional Navajos would shake hands would be very light kind of a handshake, kind of like how you might shake hands with your grandmother, sort of lightly, uh, briefly, uh, not squeezing hard. And of course, in Anglo culture, if two men shake hands like that, 
usually one of the men will think, well, what's wrong with you? Why are you shaking hands like that? You should be shaking hands firmly and look in the other person's eyes. But Navajos consider it to be rude to stare at each other's eyes. And in fact, in this picture, the man is probably looking a little bit above the woman's face on the top of her hat, and she's probably looking at his throat. And they're not actually staring at each other because traditional Navajos would consider that to be rude. I'll throw another thing in. When you're going to point, you don't point with your finger. You point with your lips. So if you're talking about something that's over to the right, maybe five miles, somebody says, where is such and such? You would just kind of lean your head slightly that direction, nod your head that way, and then your lips would move slightly that direction, and they would know that's the way you meant. But you wouldn't stick your finger out, point that direction, because that's considered pretty rude. <laughs> so it's fun to learn about other cultures and um, how they do things. Um, I'll let you read this. Uh, well, actually, I'll read it too, because there may be some people who um, can't see the screen because uh, visually impair visual impairment. Uh, this screen says the Diné religious and social systems are based on the concept of beauty, which uh, in Navajo, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, is, is Hozo. Uh, in the Navajo language, Hozo refers to harmony, order, peacefulness, and appropriateness. One must control one's thoughts and actions to be ritually and to be ritually purified if necessary and generally counteract forces that are out of control. So this is part of the idea of beauty and restoration of harmony and balance. The disturbance of the beauty may result in an illness and that might require a cure. Uh, reasons for a disturbance are a violation of spiritual taboos or regulations, if you had a bad dream, an excess of any activity, even a nice activity, uh, illness, it's very dangerous to have anything to do with the dead. In fact, if you're Hogan, which is a house that's made of um, dirt and, and logs, is like shaped kind of like an igloo. If your house, which has a door to the east so that every morning the sun comes in the door, has someone die in it, then you have to make a hole in the other side of the Hogan and take the dead person out that hole and to where they're going to be buried, and then that house is abandoned. Nobody will ever live there again. Also, you could get sick if you were around harmful animals, plants, uh, or even touching something that something else touched that was not safe. Uh, the word that has to do with witches and or uh, dead kinds of things, scary things, is chindi. So they don't go around saying that word. But if you happen to live in a house, for example, that was built on top of a abandoned um, graveyard that the builders didn't even know was there, then you might hear traditional Navajos uh, say that word while they look at you because they are thinking, hmm, this person's from an unclean place. If you've had something happen to you that's made you go out of balance, then you need to have a healer. And the healer is called a singer. The singer um, uh, will sing or chant uh, long prayers and songs. It might take days. And while they're chanting, uh, they'll be making sand paintings. So you'll notice the man on the right, there's a picture of an elder who's on his hands and knees, and he's making a very involved sand painting. The sand painting kind of goes with the prayers and with the chants. And it's not the same, but it's it, you might think of it as some something what like a uh, priest that goes through various ritual movements, lighting candles, holy water, uh, those kinds of things where the material and the spiritual get woven together and uh, hopefully bring about good results. The film you're going to see this week, Seasons of the Navajo, uh, is really the best one that we could find as far as how people traditionally lived. So it's a modern day type of film. I mean, it was made a few years ago, but things haven't really changed that much there. Um, so it shows you the traditional way with the grandparents of doing things and the children doing jobs and so on, uh, helping with the sheep, helping with the corn. And then they also spend part of their uh, year living with their parents uh, in a small town not a very big town. Most of the towns only have a thousand, two thousand people at most, and there aren't very many of them. 
All right. So now we're going to be hearing uh, a folk tale from a traditional um, elder, and um, hopefully it'll be uh, interesting for you, and I hope you enjoy it. Others that were encountered along the river in those very early times, which was probably almost 2,000 years ago when the Diné first came into the area. But the reason I point this out is because it's very important when you listen to the emergent story, that's the very first thing that they talk about and the uh, four rivers and then the uh, people they encountered. And then the very first story of Trotting Coyote is, has a setting up in the uh, area probably east of uh, Moab, Utah and up toward Grand Junction, Colorado. That's the very first setting of the uh, Totting Coyote story, the very first one. And that is that after he was given, Coyote was given the authority to have control of the weather, he's trotting along and it's a very hot day. And if you've ever been out in that area, uh, south of the uh, book cliff, you know how desolate that, that is, how dry it is. But just a few thousand feet or a few thousand feet to the north, you have that ridge the book cliffs, and on top of that is mountainous country. But the story about the fir first trotting coyote is uh, where he is trotting along, and he wishes that there was a cloud above him. And uh, in Navajo, he says, and he gets the cloud, and then he asks for a little bit more and a little bit more, and pretty soon a thunderstorm happens, and then it floods the area, and he comes in contact with uh, his cousin Skunk. And him and Skunk devise a plan that, he, that Skunk will go tell all of the rabbits and all of the prairie dogs that the uh, coyote has died. And in, in it, he referred to Doheil Dini. And he says, go and tell him Doheil Dini if Doheil Dini is dead. And so he does. And all of the rabbits and the prairie dog come around to dance and watch and see this dead coyote. And so as they come around and they gather around, uh, so the little Skunk cousin puts his rear end up into the air and sprays his uh, chemical into the air and it blinds everybody. And then him and Coyote, they club the rabbits and the prey dogs and then eventually they put them into the ground to roast them to eat. But Coyote, he wants them all for himself. And so he talks a little Coyote cousin into having a race with him. And so this is the very important part because in the traditional way that the story is told, Coyote challenges his little skunk cousin. He said, we're going to race. Whoever it wins gets all of the the prairie dogs and the rabbits. And so a little skunk uh, agrees. And Coyote says, see those five mountains over there? There's a sky. He says, when, I'm going to give you a head start. When you get to those mountains, he says, you make a fire. But when I see the smoke, then I'll take off. And so little skunk said, okay. But little skunk went a little ways and he found uh, uh, another cousin, the badger. He said, would you do me a big favor? He said, when you get on the other side of that mountain, make a fire. And so... Badger agreed, and so he, the fire was made, and then Coyote back over here saw the smoke, and he took off, and uh, as he ran toward the mountain, little skunk was hiding and saw him go by, and then little skunk comes back and digs up the rabbits and the prairie dogs and hauls it off into the rocks, high up in the rocks, and Coyote, of course, completes his race after he runs to, to the sky and comes back and uh, finds that the prairie dogs and the rabbits have been dug up. And he tracked little, his cousin Skunk out to the rocks and he sees him way up there. And he stands down at the bottom and he says, So nice, Sophie, just not us. That means, cousin, please give me back some of that food. And he throws him a bone. But the uh, main important thing is those five mountains that uh, was told in the original way that the story is told, does it die? And those today are identified as the LaSalle Mountains. And they are located east of the uh, Moab, Utah. But that's the uh, the very first trotting title story of the uh, emergence. Okay. I clicked it off and then I clicked it back on because it was kind of cool that they were singing Sheena Shah, which is a song that means there's the whole song means there's beauty above me, there's beauty below me, there's beauty all around me. I, I walk in beauty, um, which goes back to the concept of being in harmony and um, uh, with nature, with other people, and also here 
as far as not excess, which means, and not chaos, which goes to moderation, which for those of you who've studied world religions, um, that's in most of the world religions and particularly in Buddhism. Okay, so that was um, all, for <laughs> all for today. Um, we didn't talk about how the Navajos live now, but you're going to be reading about that in the book. And I hope that uh, this, this has been interesting for you and yet not too long, <laughs> okay? So have a good week and I'll see you again online. Thanks for coming.